Evolution A process of change in a certain direction A theory that the various types of organisms have their origin in other pre-existing types and that the distinguishing differences are due to modifications in successive generations. Welcome to our five-part series on evolution. In this first part, we're going to introduce the ideas of evolution and discuss the evidences that support it. However, no introduction to evolution should avoid the debate that we face in regards to teaching evolution in schools. There are a number of factions that believe we should be teaching creationism or intelligent design alongside or in lieu of evolution in our science classrooms. This is a touchy subject because it challenges people's faith. Spending my entire career teaching in Episcopal schools has given me many opportunities to address these issues and we can discuss them more in class, but I want to start by saying where I stand on the issue. I'm committed to teaching evolution in my biology course. This in no way devalues mine or my school's commitment to faith. The Episcopal approach to education is not one that presses an ideology, but values open intellectual inquiry. Our appreciation for the complexity of these issues can strengthen our faith. I believe that most of the controversy comes from people's misunderstanding of Darwin's ideas. By the end of this unit, I hope that you will not confuse the concepts of evolution by natural selection with the theories on the origin of life. These are two separate issues and we will discuss both. Now, natural selection is a widely accepted idea, supported and understood by, many, by much scientific evidence, testable hypotheses, and experimentation. While as the origin of life is less substantiated, uh, not fully understood, and you know, open to debate. Darwin's ideas did not attempt to explain the origin of life, but instead the origin of species. There have been many inquiries into the origin of life with no definite conclusions. Later in this series of videos, we will investigate the possible chemical evolution that would have made life on Earth possible. The ideas coming from evolution that are most offensive to people's religious beliefs are those ideas about the origin of man. And here again, I find that mostly it's about misconception. Of course, these are all kind of jokes, but the misconception that man came from ape. It turns out that man did not come from ape. A better understanding is to say that apes and man came from a common ancestor. This is still an idea that makes some people uncomfortable. Now, we don't discuss origin of man too much in our course, but there are, are many um, very good uh, resources you can find um, from very reputable um, sources like Natural Geographic or Discovery Channel uh, if you want to study that. I'll try to find some links and put them under the video. Darwin's ideas on natural selection are some of the most important in the history of science. They can be applied confidently to explain how species change over time, or how they don't change, and how they provide a mechanism for the origin of new species from existing ones. These ideas have stood up under many years of scientific scrutiny and are accepted by the worldwide scientific community. While we accept that alternate theories exist, those based in theological discourse rather than scientific discourse belong in our religion classes, not in our science classrooms. Now, being the, the curious person that I am, I always want to come at this with a little bit of skepticism. So if I were trying to be convinced, if you were trying to convince me of evolution, what would you use as evidence? One of the first places we look for evidence of evolution, or one of the first pieces of evidence we have, is biodiversity. The sheer diversity of living things is evidence that things have changed over time. There's just so much different stuff out there. This massive biodiversity has to be explained by something. Well, another piece of evidence we have to support evolution is the ideas behind biogeography. The study of how populations have been distributed across space and geologic time. When we look at how species are spread across the world, we see that some animals are isolated in some areas and some can cross continents and we get the idea of endemic species, species that only seem to um, have arisen in certain uh, isolated areas. Uh, you can think about the giant tortoises of the Galapagos Islands, that was a, a very strong example that we see in our textbook, um, but also the, um, the superiority of the marsupials uh, in Australia, um, the lemurs of Madagascar. Um, this idea that these species are isolated in particular to their area area um, suggests that they evolved there. Another idea is kind of the opposite idea. When we look at uh, how fossil records have shown us that over time the continents may have been connected um, and this biogeography, the looking at the geology of the, 
the continents and the distribution of fossil records gives us some indication of how things may have been spread across time and its evidence of change. Now, another place where we find very distinct evidence of change, very concrete evidence, is that of fossil records. It can show us gradual changes over time and, and different forms and uh, ev um, evidence of extinction where we see organisms of shapes that don't exist anymore, um, which suggests, uh, again, that we have a process of change. One problem with the fossil record, though, is that it's incomplete. It's very difficult for some uh, soft-bodied animals and plants to fossilize. It just doesn't work very well. Um, so we have some records of change, but uh, it's not a complete record, and it certainly alone could not explain or be the evidence of evolution. Another area we look for for evidence of evolution is structure. We look at how uh, things are like similar uh, anatomy, and we look at things called homologies. Homologous structures are structures that have the same evolutionary origin, but could have a different function. When we look at the underlying structure of the forelimbs of vertebrates, a human arm, a wing of a bird, the flipper of a porpoise, and the front leg of an elephant, we see the same basic underlying bone structure, the same bones in the same order. They might be a little thicker or, or longer, but basically it's the same. They're homologous, they're alike, which is evidence of um, evolutionary relationship. We did say, uh, we will say in class that we need to be careful of analogous structures, structures that had the same, same function, but not necessarily the same origin. Like the wing of a fly and the wing of a bird, they're both for flying, but they didn't have the same evolutionary origin. They originated at different times. Sometimes a structure can be both homologous and analogous, say the wing of a bird and the wing of a bat. But just beware that analogous structures are not evidence of evolutionary relatedness, whereas homologous structures are. Another place where we can see uh, structure giving us evidence of change is in vestigial structures. These small, incomplete organs with no apparent function that seem to be left over from an earlier form. If we see hip bones in a snake, well, hip bones are to connect the legs to the uh, vertebral, vertebral column. So snakes don't need hip bones, and neither do whales. And we see these vestigial hip bones and leg bones in whales that are undersized and certainly have no function. Here are the hip bones in a snake, and even whoops, even the tailbone of humans, or the appendix in humans, a uh, tailbone is to support a tail, and we no longer have a tail. It suggests that we evolved from an, organ, an animal uh, that had a tail. But again, all we're saying is that vestigial structures are evidence of change, and that's what we're looking for as evidence of evolution. Another area where we can find um, evidence of evolutionary relationships is in embryology, looking at embryo development. When we look at comparative embryology, we see that embryos look similar early in their development and start to look dissimilar later in their development, but how long they stay looking similar uh, is relative to how closely related those species are evolutionarily. So up here we have a pig and a cow and a rabbit and a human over here on the right side. Those are all um, mammals, so they stay similar looking for very long periods of time. Uh, we add though in the other vertebrates, fish, amphibians, uh, reptiles and birds, and we see that there are um, differences earlier on in the process. But the fact that they go through the same stages in the same order um, is evidence that there's a common lineage. What other evidence do we have of evolution? We can look at molecular biology. Modern technology has allowed us to look at both protein sequences and amino and uh, DNA sequences and to see how closely or, or how different different species are. You know, here's an example of using the DNA code or a section of DNA code to differentiate the subtleties between very similar species. Sometimes when you look at the species, the physical traits and even behavioral or other characteristics are so similar that the only way to tease apart the different subspecies is to look at this genetic code. The evidence of evolution comes from both the similarities and the differences. And finally, there's one more piece of, of evidence that we have to support the idea that species can change. And it comes from artificial selection. The idea that over time, we can, as man, choose how a species will look. A real concrete example is looking at dog breeds. We have, over you know, thousands of years of selective breeding, uh, created different breeds of dogs with different uh, characteristics. Um, we've made dogs are good working dogs, and dogs are hunting dogs, and dogs are just you know small and cute enough to put in a handbag. 
I've done the same thing with peppers by selectively crossing different strains of, of hot peppers. You can make peppers with lots of different flavors um, and they've been specialized. So the idea is that species can change if we choose who can breed um, and who can reproduce. So um, we know that, that the look of a population can change over time. The point is we have many different sources of evidence that support the idea that uh, things can change over time, that evolution can happen. But evidence alone is not enough. If I'm truly skeptical and you show me all these different pieces of evidence, I'm still going to ask this question. How? If you're going to convince me that evolution is a real thing, just showing me the examples uh, or, or evidence that things may have changed isn't going to be enough. I'm going to need a process. How does it happen? And that's the topic of our next video, where we're going to look at natural selection. We'll have to slow down and give a little bit of history, uh, in terms maybe call it the evolution of evolution, but then we'll talk about a specific process for genes as proposed by Charles Darwin. So come back for that video. If you have any questions about this one, sorry I had kind of a slow start and um, had to talk a little bit about why we teach evolution, but uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below, and I hope you learned something.